Oops. Okay. Uh, yeah. So today's topic, I actually just prepared this like within the past couple hours. I decided this morning to present this. Uh, th this is I'm showing some experiment results from that I that I got last week, and I put them together into some slides. And I was like, hey, I should I should give an actual full presentation on this because there's there's just a nice little idea, a nice compact little set of results. Uh, so. So yeah, here, I guess I, I called this a possible explanation for grid cell distortions. And um, so, so first, I'm just going to give you some background why I'm talking about grid cell distortions uh, and, and what I'm referring to when I say grid cell distortions. So I, I made this a little dramatic. I call it the elephant in the room because sometimes I kind of think it is. Uh, the, so here is a, a picture of what grid cells do in a somewhat large box. Now this is um, this is a 2.2 meter by 2.2 meter box. It's larger than the original set of boxes were. The like the 2005 um, um, seminal grid cell paper used like I think it was one meter by one meter boxes. Once you do larger boxes and in a number of other situations, you start to see uh, grid cells being not as regular as we would kind of like them to be. Uh, at, you can see, I mean, I'm just going to draw your eyes to, um, well, first, let me just read the quote, because it's, otherwise it's just kind of glaring down here. Uh, the, the, I, I, I want to emphasize that a common sentiment among people who study grid cells is that we're not so sure it's providing a metric, um, because it's, it's just messier than we'd like it to be. So I'll just read the quote. Uh, it, it, this was in a presentation from 2016, so I haven't, I don't know what John O'Keefe's current thinking is, but he said like, um, the spectacular grid cells, which until very recently, we thought were providing something like a metric for the map, uh, but we're not so sure anymore. And he was, he said that uh, because of this, this figure essentially, and something from his lab, which I'll also show in a couple slides, where he was using um, trapezoidal rooms. But even just, I, I feel like this is a, um, a better example because it's just a big box. It's not an oddly shaped room. You could make the case that rats don't deal with box shaped things, but still it's, uh, uh, this makes me nervous about the metric interpretation of grid cells. And, um, and so the, in this presentation, I'm gonna offer a defense for the metric interpretation, but right now I'm just doing the background of why, why it needs a defense. Uh, looking at this, looking at this figure, I mean, I'll just draw your attention to a couple parts. Um, up here, these fields, like the distance between them, is much, much smaller than like the distance between these two fields. Uh, in fact, if you, in fact, a theme in this room is that the upper left corner of it has this um, very small scale compared to the scale over here, and just in general, like the, there's there are slight orientation changes. It's um, it's confusing, and this is why this 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 is why it's been on my mind for a while, as I'll show in the next slide. Uh, so, over the years, I've been Marcus. Before go I go, can we go back yeah. to that slide? Yeah. One thing that's always confused me about this, and maybe you can answer this question. Um, we know that grid cells they, they have this phase precession, right? So, so when a cell fires um, in the, in the theta cycle. Uh, varies how far it is from the, the center of the receptor field in some sense, right? So when they show figures like this, there's, there seems to be two conflicting things going on. One is that the rat hasn't traveled everywhere in this room. So you can you can see that some parts of the where the rat, like in the bottom left, and even in the upper left corner, that the rat hasn't gone as often. So we don't know what those data points are. Right. And then the second thing is, is you know, what are they, what, are they just saying every time the cell fires? And so, so if I only showed that when cell fired right in peak with a phase, it would be much sharper. Um, these these uh, reference these, these, these receptive fields would be much sharper. Uh, do you know how they how they accommodate for the for the phase precession when they show these images here? I think the quick answer is they don't. Uh, they they just show all the all the places that the cell fires. So that's that's a bit misleading. It would be very interesting to see if they you know if they they could these could be much more narrow blobs. I assume. If they only show the, the spikes that occurred very close to the peak of the phase, theta phase, um, is, would that be right? I think so. That would definitely be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because that's a confounding situation here because you can say, hey, this cell is not very accurate, but what we know is that the cells are actually much more accurate than they look like. I'm not saying you wouldn't have these distortions. I'm not countering that. I'm just saying that the image here would be much more accurate or precise 
if um, if we could account for the phase precession, uh, we would see much uh, more accurately where the center of these blobs are, and, and many of these outlying points when they, they explained. So I, I just think it's a confusing point whenever I see these images. I'm wondering why people haven't corrected for it. Yeah, I think that that's uh, in general that's a big a blind spot that is that we have from looking at these types of images is everything related to time, everything related to um, yeah, when they fired. We don't we don't know what the firing rates are from this. There's just a lot. Um, and and there's all these holes. You can see there's whole bunch of holes here. You say, oh, there's nice clear spaces between these blobs, but there's places where the rat has never been. Yeah. So, so it's like, well, we can't really read too much into that either. Um, again, not not countering the distortion. I'm just saying that because you know, I've always looked at these images and say, oh, they're so messy. You know, they don't look you know accurate at all. But then you really don't know. You can't tell that. Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't misreading that. No, yeah, that's that's a totally valid line of thought. Okay. Uh, so so this has been in the back of my mind for quite a while uh, because I I'm open to other hypotheses about grid cells. There maybe there are other ones, and and the first one, the the first quote unquote other hypothesis uh, that that seemed plausible to me. Uh, I'm not convinced, but it's definitely on my short list of things that might be true, is this one from Kim Stackenfeld, Matt Botvinnik, and Sam Gershman. Um, and that one, it, it would take too long for me to go into detail about it. I've talked about it a little in the past. Uh, I'm going to put some of my own words on it. Uh, and those words would, would be that, like, okay, the spatial view of grid cells is not quite right. Uh, the right way to think of it is that grid cells are being used to simulate a linear system. It's linear systems like, um, so I'll just continue reading. We engineers know that solving a linear system of differential equations requires converting to an eigenbasis. Um, conveniently, grid cell firing fields look a lot like an eigenbasis. It looks a lot like encoding location in a eigenvector basic based basis. Uh, and um, they provide this. This line of thought has been thought provoking to me. And also, um, I'm I'm sort of backdating some information here. Um, they've they've done some more recent work uh, involving also Magnume. And um, and so me calling it a like differential equation and linear system. Some of that actually comes from this more recent paper. But I think that something like like that was in their heads back then. Uh, and so I still like this. It's thought provoking to me. It's a, it's in my list of possibilities. But I'm not. But I'm also not totally convinced that it explains the multiple grid cell phases and why you would have lots and lots of grid cells with the same scale and orientation. Or, they predict you'd have some with the same scale and orientation, but I don't think they predict you'd have lots. But I, but there's a serious chance I'm missing something. They might have a good answer to that question. Uh, other things you all have heard me bring up over the years of me of me trying to make sense of this, me trying to build up a coherent mental model that um, that makes grid cells spatial while also making them exhibit distortions. Uh, it, the early one that I really liked, um, I was calling stretchy maps. I think I might have been under the influence of Tim Barron's stretchy birds when I was using those words. Um, so the idea that we take, we have a set of maps that we reuse in a lot of contexts. We have a map and we stretch it on to different environments. And once we stretch it onto the environment, you now, it's like you have um, a, a playbook of actions that you could take. Uh, pl a playbook of things you've done in situations like this. By stretching a map onto an environment, you can generalize across environments, generalize action. And that to me is, is still like a really nice candidate. It, it Isn't might that close yeah. to what you're currently proposing? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'd say that's, well, I'll get to that, the 2021 one here. I, I took a total, uh, this this 2021 was a little bit influenced by the Stackenfeld idea. Um, I'll, I'll just summarize it. We, I've, I gave a presentation on, on in December, and it's still interesting to me. Um, you could call it taking the Fourier transform and making it more general and calling it um, a, a basis for representing sensory input. I don't think it's good for me to dive too deep in this right now, but it's what I was talking about in recent videos, basically. And it, to me, it's still a fun idea. Um, and it, it, I could talk about things I don't like about it, but it's still in my list of candidates. Um, but now this brings me to today's topic, um, which, so the stretchy maps idea from before, I've, I've sort of run with that, but, but um, changed it a little bit. 
Uh, and so I'll just read the sentence I wrote here. Um, so distortions are sort of a natural result of fitting idealized parts onto actual environments. Um, and I'm making the distinction of parts, reusing parts rather than reusing entire maps here. So it's like you have a set of reusable parts that you uh, that you sort of lock onto the things around you, and then you learn that arrangement of reusable parts. Uh, and but it's closely related. In fact, the rest of this presentation is equally about both of these. Uh, I'm not gonna. Um, I'm not actually gonna use parts here. Uh, I'm the rest of this presentation is is going to be evaluating is this this general idea that the stretchy maps the reuse of parts idea a good explanation for grid cell distortions and in a simulation I ran that um that I thought that I think was was nice it doesn't provide an unambiguous answer to this question but I think it's a nice result it's it's a fun result at the very least uh, and so I'll I'll go ahead and jump into what I did what I did so um. The general experiment is, can I explain grid cell distortions, like actual ones, actual ones from papers, using this, this cartoon, the mental model suggested by this cartoon? Uh, and that, that cartoon is like um, the agent, a rat, um, what the, the, the problem, a problem it's solving when it's localizing, when it's deciding which grid cell to activate, is um, it's looking at its surroundings and trying to sort of simplify them into an idealized into idealized objects or into an idealized map. So here I show this rat looking at this you set of rocks or boulders, and it's it's thinking to itself, uh, modeling this complicated object as a oriented rectangle. Where am I relative to it? And the, the point I make here is that the rat's answer to that question is going to exhibit distortions based on where it is. Uh, it's parallel lines on its map relative to that rectangle um, will tend to not always be parallel uh, in the real world, especially as you get close to the object. Uh, and people who, people who are familiar with grid cell distortions know that they tend to occur near the boundaries or near objects and such. So that this to me seems like a potential plausible uh, answer. Uh, and, it, and it also just fits with what we kind of expect AI systems to do, or intelligence, I don't know, things operating in the world to do, is that they take their input and they kind of describe it in terms of idolized objects. And, uh, and so it, this to me is an elegant explanation for why you would expect uh, distortions. But okay, it's elegant, but does it explain the empirical ones is, is what I had to experiment with. I liked the idea going in. I just needed to know, does it explain empirical distortions? So what I what I did was I took these distortions. This is the same field I was showing you before, but it does a heat map. And this is this is another one in a trapezoidal room from O'Keefe's lab, uh, where uh, you can see that the orientation kind of changes. Also, the scale changes over here. These fields are closer together. These ones are further apart. And when you say um, the orientation, you mean the orientation of the 60 degree um, lattice. Is that what you mean? Yes, yes. Okay. So yeah, uh, they depict it as the fact that this this line that's connecting these dots is curving. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so over here, you would say that this has a different quote unquote orientation than this. Um, so I did not reach out to these labs and get their data. Rather, I copy and pasted their figures into Illustrator, drew dots over theirs at the center of the fields um, and basically imported this and tried to explain these. Uh, so, so I took theirs, kind of simplified them into this set of dots, the centers of the firing fields, and, um, and tried to explain those. And so I'll go on and show the rest of my setup. So the algorithm here, and um, for, the, for anyone familiar with the Huff transform, this is going to be a little bit like that. Uh, the, the algorithm here is like the way that the animal localizes is uh, it detects distances from various points on boundaries and it uses those points to vote on the agent's location. Uh, so, so here I've showed a rat uh, with an idealized object. In this case, the obje idealized object is actually curvy. Uh, and and that, that is confusing because this is the exact opposite we just showed. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I agree. I'll have to, if I if I give like more official presentations on that, I might have to figure out a way. You're to probably change it or something. 
because because the actual environments in this case are straight uh, so so i will have to change something this figure is the writer one the earlier ones are the confusing ones so um yeah so so it's like you you look around you look at how far you are away you are from points on the wall and you compare it to your idealized curvy wall and each of those sort of each of those points sort of votes on where you are uh, and i show this as like all these arrows land on the same point here but they land on different points here and um that's, oh, that's not go on oh, oh i see okay. that was um yeah and, uh, but, but go on go on sorry yeah, I think I'm a bit confused about maybe with that point you guys were discussing just a second ago. If if the actual wall is straight, why would your idealized one be curved? Why wouldn't you just use a straight one as your idealized one? Well, I, I, I guess my hypothesis is that um, is that animals use have a reusable set of parts that they use to re reconstruct lots of environments. And will they so actually wouldn't they have a straight parts? one as well? So maybe like they wouldn't. That's what I've I, got the same question about waiting. Yeah, because it seems like the straight wall is the, is the preferred to, to the idealized version to curve. So uh, my quick answer here is that um, is that I am trying to explain this actual neural data and and if you're right, in, in a sense, like if you're right, the um, the best way, my uh, your your intuition makes sense. I don't. Uh, so uh, I mean, maybe maybe we so, can say this is a is, you're working on a sort of partial result here, saying, okay, um, can you maybe going to work up an illustration why if there was an idealized curve wall, why would this show the distortions that we're seeing? Well, keep in mind, I'm not. I'm not saying there's an idealized curve wall. This is just a cartoon picture. I understand, I'm, but I'm going to let this discover the idealized parts. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, but, okay. But, yeah. But so, it does, so it does assuming say assuming the model is correct. Assuming the model is correct, here's the data. What is the idealized figure that would generate these distortions? Exactly. That's yeah. kind it of does, the question. It does. It does seem like a straight wall would be clearly one of the idealized objects. It does seem like that would be one. With, that would be one where you would expect it to get it right. Right. Yeah. It, uh, Okay. I mean, what you're, the words you're saying make sense. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm a little confused by this. Uh, okay. I'm, I, I'm in the state of trying to decide why wouldn't the, the rat use straight parts? Maybe it uses parts that are more similar to Gabor filters in the sense that like, hey, visual cortex doesn't use straight lines. Visual cortex uses Gabor filters. Uh, maybe there's actually unintuitively a, a more useful uh, type of part than what we would intuitively choose. Yeah, okay, that's that may be right. Although the the, the cartoon illustration with them with the boulders <clears throat> really suggests it was very more simplistic than that. Like, oh yeah, it's just, yeah. You know, you know, so you're I, you're I, right that you're right that I, my, the way I present this, the first half kind of makes the second half confusing. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, to show you the rest of the setup, um, oh oh oh, I should I, I never said this last part. Um, you have to weight the votes by nearness. Uh, which is to say, um, if you if you're taking in like a bunch of sensory observations, there's an object over there, an object over there. You use the nearby one. Uh, you give it more weight and and voting on where you are. Uh, it, it, th th this is a principled thing because you that is a um, there's less error in that displacement vector, so that actually kind of comes naturally. Um, uh, also, that last part is required for distortions to occur. Well, you know, that seems to be, just thinking about it very briefly here and, and not deeply, that seems on its own could lead to lots of distortion, right? Just the, this like, oh, I'm looking at a straight wall and I'm trying to figure out where I am. Um, if I bias my voting by just the proximity of the nearest points in the wall, um, and I always do that, and now I'm moving parallel to the wall, um, that seems on its own would lead to distortion. Or is it not? I mean, because you're not really taking the account of the. You know, no, it, basically, that all I have is local information about the wall, and and uh, I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't even know I'm moving in some sense. I'm like, like I, I'd almost it'd be almost like a boundary seller. Um, uh, I can always confuse boundary versus border, <laughs> but, but it's almost like the, saying the, they're the same thing. There's no. Well, one, one is that one is you can't cross over, and one is you can. Right? So, um, 
it just seems like if all I had was the local closest, if all I was using was the information that's the closest part of the wall, then as I move, I wouldn't actually know I'm moving. I mean, I wouldn't be able to judge my position differently. I'd have to be, we talked about this last week, I'd have to be looking at the endpoints to really know where I am. Right, so so here I'm I'm assuming you're you're like looking at the wall, you're segmenting it maybe in the fifths as I've shown here, and you're localizing relative to those points. Yeah. So but so if, here if actually, bias, if I bias to the center, if I bias to the center because that's the closest one, right? That's but if if the wall matches the idealized part, there are not going to be distortions because all of the parts are going to be voting for the same location. I'm just pointing out uh, at, at, at its extreme, the, the distant points could be, their, their vote could be zero. They could have no, yeah. no, and at that point, then I don't have any way to judge my movement by looking at the wall. Um, I, I just would, and then I would expect to see the same grid cell active as I move along the wall. Um, okay, I, I'm just thinking what it means to, the extreme version of voting uh, weights based on distance and nearness. But, but I, I still, I, I still hold that like distortions won't happen um, in that extreme version if if the idealized parts match the actual world perfectly. All right. Well, I keep going. I, I keep going. Okay. It, I mean, the fun images are coming soon. Just one more, okay. one more introduction. Well, this well, this one was fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so the. Here's, here's what I thought was cool that it was possible. Starting out last week when I, when I jumped into this, I wasn't sure that I was gonna be able to find a way to do this. So I, I found a way to figure out what is, the, what is an idealized map that leads to grid cell firing fields that look like this. So I'm solving for what's in this thought bubble. And, and that's the funny thing about um, differentiable programming is it can do things that surprise you, like uh, all of the things I just described to you, like the weighted voting, that's all differentiable. Uh, so you, you just set this up, you set a variable of grid cell scale, you set a variable for grid cell orientation, another one for the phase, uh, and then you find a way to, to describe where these boundaries are. Uh, and you can just set this up and have it discover what parts, uh, where you have it discover what idealized map will, will cause this. Uh, so that brings me to results. Uh, so here's what pops out, uh, and and for these for these two different for these two different rooms, uh, if I fit the the map the, uh, to the grid, uh, what pops out the 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 real output here is is this right column. In the middle, I show what the simulated grid cell looks like. That's these white uh, um, bumps the, or these white fields. And um, I overlay the actual, the red ones. And what I find that if this explanation of grid cell distortions is correct, here is what the idealized map probably looks like. Uh, and I mean, the things I was saying before, how the scale over here seems to be smaller than the scale over here is reflected by a, how this is small. This, this, this has kind of been blown up in this upper left corner. Wouldn't that make them bigger there if it's blown up in that photo thing corner? It seems like if I stretched out the corner, I would be stretching apart the points as opposed to compressing them. And then if I get the compressed lower left hand corner or the lower right hand corner, you'd think they would be closer together. I mean, maybe the thing, the way to think of this is like the distance from here to here is two scales. Uh, whereas the distance from here to here is one scale. So, but that means you have to pack in more space right here than you do here. Um, you lost me on that one. I just feel like, imagine if I, let's say if I had a, a square and I, and I had equally spaced grid cell points, and then I, then I smushed the square as in your idealized map you show there. Well, in that case, the points would be closer together on the bottom than at the top. So I'm, I'm a, but maybe that's not the right way of interpreting it, but that seems like what would have happened. I would have just squished everything together at the bottom and, and the things at the top would be more rarefied. But is this the opposite? It seems like the place at the top where you have the most space, you, this, this receptor fields are closer together. I'm missing something. It's intuitively sort of backwards what I would have guessed. 
So maybe I'm not thinking about it correctly. I mean, one way one way to think of it is like the distance from this end to this end is about four scales. When you say when you it, say four scale, I mean four four bots, four grid cell dots. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. maybe four and a half. But yeah, so the distance from this to this side is maybe four, four and a half. Four, re four receptive fields, let's say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the distance from this to this is more like five or five and a half. Yes. So maybe that's, does that intuition fit? Well, yeah, but then, but but that's the physical distance, right? Um, uh, okay, I, I see what you're saying. I was assuming I had a square thing with equal fields. And then I squished it to look like this ideal map. And then it wouldn't produce what you said. I would have closer spaces on the bottom. However, I think what you're saying is, if I put an, a, a regular array of grid cells on the idealized map, so they're perfectly, they're perfectly spaced apart on the idealized map, and then I stretch the idealized map out to be square, then you get what you saw. So yeah. uh, uh, it's not clear why. <laughs> I mean, I can follow that, but it's, I'm losing the logic behind it in terms of like, well, why, what would I expect it to be? Um, I see what you're saying. Yes, I see what you're saying. Uh, it's like, it's like if, I had a, if I had a perfect grid cell map in this, in this not in the, don't call it a map, the idealized map. It's that, that's like the, that's what the room is like. If the room was like that distorted little room there and I put a perfect grid cell array on it and then I stretch the room out to be square, Yes, it would look like what you said. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, most of my results here, there's not a lot to say other than just to say, here's what pops out. It's this, uh, it, it suggests that if this is the right way of thinking about grid cell distortions, it's that the actual maps we form tend to be more curvy and messy. Well, all right. But now you're, now you, it, I think you've kind of complicated your hypothesis in the beginning, which you seemed pretty good. Um, it's now, now, you're left data. This, now you're left with this question is like, well, why do the rats think the room looks like this weird stretchy thing? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what you're saying. You're saying the rat, the rat, you know, thinks of a room this way. This, this is uh, because there's no landmarks in this room. It's just a square room. There's nothing else. Right. So for somebody who's the rat in this square room and is modeling it as if it's this, you know, distorted room. Um, and if, and yeah, in particular, why, why would the distorted room, why would the idealized one be asymmetrical in that sense? Like it's wider at the top and yeah. narrower at the bottom. Like what, what would cause it to create an, uh, an asymmetric idealized map? Yeah, I mean, these are the questions that are brought up by this. I, yeah. I'm doing yeah. my best to explain grid cells. No, I think, well, I think it's interesting. <laughs> I think what you've shown is pretty interesting. But I'm not sure it's a supporting your hypothesis. <laughs> it's, it's like saying, no, I, I agree, but but there ought yeah. to be some hypothesis for okay. Uh, All right. So if, I think, if grid cells are metric, there should be a hypothesis. And okay. I want right. To know it. All right. Great. I think it's great. So the question now begs the question, which is what Subhita was asking, and somewhat I was asking as well. Is like, why the hell does the rat think the room looks like this? I mean, is is there something about this room that makes it distort this way? I mean, and it's such a weird distortion because if it's if there's no other landmark, I, of course we never know what the rat's actually seeing because the yeah. rat these boxes are open to the ceiling and they never talk about that, and so there's all kinds of other stuff that they're observing in the room. You know, who knows? Maybe they're navigating to some light fixture in the ceiling, and and we don't even know that. And, and it's you know what I'm saying. And so, um, so but it begs the question: Why would the rat think of the room like this? distorted room and, and it's weirdly distorted it's, it's asymmetrical it's got curves it's got you know it's like what the hell you know it's like okay yeah okay that would explain it but why um it kind of it kind of makes the the idealized component idea uh, which i liked a lot uh, it kind of it kind of says hmm these don't look like idealized components at all these look like some weird thing that's going on here yeah um I wonder, I wonder if it could be stuff in the room itself, you know, I guess it's to remind everyone, the rat, these are open boxes and there's stuff on the ceiling and people walking around and machines and the rats can see this stuff and they don't have to talk about it. And that's how the rats orient themselves mostly to the room. Because in this case, maybe the room had no uh, distinguishing landmarks. 
So for the rat to even orient itself at all, it's orientating, it's orientating itself to things above the box that we can't, or we are not told about. And um, that could lead to these sort of, you know what I'm saying? That, I mean, it, there's nothing in the box that suggests that the thing should be distorted at all, or even how to orient. Unless you know more about this experiment that, you know, these experiments where they, they controlled for the ceiling. No, I don't have a good answer to that. And I mean, the random walking is, um, the random foraging comes from them dropping in food at, food at random locations. Yeah. Uh, so something's going on above the rat that is dropping food in. I don't know what that looks like. I don't think it's yeah. just a person because I think well, they actually right. So just it. this review here, there's nothing in the room itself which would suggest orientation. Yet the rat is oriented in the room, right? The, 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 the head director self must be oriented. Otherwise you wouldn't see any of this stuff. And the, then, sometimes that sometimes they do use cue cards for these kinds of things. I know, I but, but, for but the, okay, because well, this, for, the, for for this one, I'm almost positive they used a cue card. This one, I don't remember. Well, even the trapezoidal one, you could um, uh, whatever it is, it's not a trapezoid, but whatever it is, quadrilateral one. There, you could um, you could imagine that there are some distinguishing features of the room. The corners are not identical, right? Um, so I could you could put me in a, in a a room like that, and I could orient myself on it if there was nothing else other than the shape of the room. But the square, I couldn't. There's, there's four equally valid orientations, and how would I know which one? Um, so I'm wondering. I'm wondering, Marcus, is in trying to preserve your hypothesis, but the hypothesis would be that the rat is the is the things it's observing. The chunks are not the, anything part of the room because there's nothing in the room that suggests that. But it might be something the rat is observing overhead. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like in the in the bottom left corner, there's a researcher standing there looking down at the rat. You know, so it's like he's following around the curvature of the researcher. I mean, it, it could be that's I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. We just don't. I wonder if there, if for some, you know, some, you know, you mentioned there's food being dropped. I wonder just by random chance, maybe more food is dropped at the top than the bottom, or you know, something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really a map of an actionable map for the rat <laughs> or the yeah, mouse, right. you know, like this where, where it's of, able to get of, food, food. This is the rapid map of food. That's a good point. Like where the points are closer together, maybe uh, that's where the more food was dropped. And therefore the rat has a finer navigation control over there to differentiate between the points where he found food in the past. Well, anyway, it, it, it does bring up a very big question. It's, there's no explanation why the room would be distorted as it is. Your idealized map would be distorted. There's, there's nothing here that we know right at the moment. So we're hypothesizing what else could cause it. Um, yeah, that, that last general idea is, is definitely promising. That, and I think some people sort of think that way that um, that the map is, I mean, there's, there's literally a grid, there's literally a paper called like the grid cell map is attracted to goals, something along those lines. And yeah. the, the idea is that it gives more space, more grid cell space to places that it is more often though that that just starts to seem a lot less metric that's just different well you know i, I write but it, but you're not your your this figure does not support your your initial claim very well and i, like I, I know it's it. it's it's like a tepid support uh, i agree uh well it's it's sort of like well we're partially there there you could partially explain some mechanism here but it doesn't it really it almost suggests that it's something else is going on because there's some other, there's some other thing which is leading to the distortions other than the idealized um, objects versus real objects. Um, something's causing these distortions, as I have shown here. Interesting. I mean, it's sort of a different set of question, a different question. How would someone experimentally test this hypothesis in a way that rules out other hypotheses? Like, how would you know what the idealized map actually? Or is there some way to test test this? No, this is a, this is a good question. I'd say I'd say like uh, maybe the worst part of this of this theory, mine, the the idealized map one, is that it can be used to prove any firing fields. Uh, I could come up with any weird shape to prove just about anything, uh, and so it's hard to falsify, uh, which doesn't make it wrong. But it doesn't make it right. It's just uh, what a, a issue there. I don't have a good answer to that. Other than it's what we're doing right now. It's, it's you, you take a human, you look at what it outputs and just say, come on, that can't be right. 
that's th that's the best that I think you can do. Um, and or you know we look at this, we might say, come on, that can't be right. Or we look at this and we say, um, that's interesting. Maybe there's this other thing where like the amount of time you spend in a certain part of the room is given preference. And then, so maybe it's a connector to a second part of the theory, but either way, um, that's that's the way this takes on. I, you can't get something that's immediately falsifiable in, a, in, a, in an automatic way. You know, going back to your original proposal, like, oh, well, we build up these rooms of these idealized objects. In some sense, I feel that has to be true. You know, it just has to be true. I mean, uh, everything we know is in some sense an idealized version of it. There's more detail. I think think of any object that I know, oh, it's the chair I'm looking at next to me here. Well, I have this model of the chair, but that model is not act, it's not the actual chair. The actual chair has far more details and dimensions and so on that I don't have in my model. So I'm I have a model of the chair that's in some sense, in some ways, a distortion of the chair. It's not, it's not an accurate of the chair and and so that's like a, a given and I, I think the idea that when we when we enter a new environment or we, we're exploring something new we will if there, are, if there are things in it that are sort of familiar we'll just assume it's like the one we had before and and so I think that idea is almost has to be true I don't know if it has to lead to grid self distortion that's a that's a separate question um so but I think these pictures here show that the grid self distortions are more complicated than that something else going on. You know, there's another distortion too we've talked about a lot, which we, I think still begs explanation. I'm gonna throw it in just for completeness, is that we know that grid cells um, don't always fire when, when we expect them to, and they do so in a repeatable way, right? So they'll have missing, uh, if you look at any particular grid cell, and it'll sometimes not, in a particular environment, will not fire in a particular spot repeatedly and reliably, but in other environments, it would, so there's another something going on there too. There's another sort of unexpected grid cell behavior. Um, I just throw that in for completeness. Uh, that uh, there's something else we don't understand about grid cells. One thing I've wondered is if that is actually the same type of distortion. If that's a case where, well, there's a grid cell distortion, uh, and the reason this one's not firing is because another one is. <laughs> because uh, and we just uh, not recording that other one. But remember, it was if we go back, there was that paper with it showed that the six or so um, repetitive um, phase clusters or whatever they're called, right? So there's not one grid cell. It, there's like six clusters of these grid cells. That, so there's like six parallel operating units. That's a good point. I see what and, you're getting. And at. and then and then uh, I forget the term. I forget the name of the person who wrote the paper. And I forget the David term. Tank. Yeah, and... Tank. Thank you. Um, and so, but then there was a whole bunch of other papers on the same idea. Um, and so it said yes. If there's six of these, six cells should all be firing at this point, and five of them do, and one of them doesn't, and it's the same one every time that doesn't do it. So that doesn't quite fit the. Portion. That's a good point. Unless, unless those six parts are somehow in, independent of each other. But no, you're right. Yeah. That's a good point. It doesn't look like they are, but yeah. Well, I think if that's, that's fun little things to look at. These are fun pictures. <laughs> I, think, I think you've opened up a Pandora's box here a bit. You've got more questions. It, it's, it's challenging original assumption. Um, I, I mean, like I'd say my original assumption is that, uh, is that grid cell distortions uh, or tell us that there's something we haven't figured out yet, and and that and I'm I'm trying to make it where we don't have to think about them anymore. But I yeah. don't think you've succeeded in that. <laughs> no, I don't think so because the, you've given us a square box, which I would have said, okay, the square box is not going to have any distortions because that's the most idealized thing I could possibly have. <laughs> and and they're like, and there you see all these distortions. I'm like, holy crap, you know. Uh, because in the beginning, you're showing the distortions near a corner or near the mountain range or corners in the paper. Um, you know, okay, I got that. I believe that, right? And now, now you're like giving me the perfect box. I was like, oh, I can't explain that. You know? but, but the fact is, uh, I mean, experimentally, even in a perfect box, you do see the distortions. Well, apparently, still yes. a big puzzle. I, it yeah. is a puzzle. So I think, I mean, we've come up with two hypotheses of why that is. Uh, I mean, there's something has to lead to, I mean, there's something in the environment which is leading to it. I assume that this is a consistent grid, that this result is consistent, that these distortions of the grid cells are not moving around. I don't know if that's true, but that's my assumption. Like if I yeah. put the rat back in this box, this is what the grid cell fields would look like. 
Now, how yeah, they, could they, that they specifically emphasize that, especially the O'Keefe paper. They were, they put that even like right in the abstract that like they're 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 permanent or they they just they okay. stay. Okay, like so that. there has yeah, to but be. If you, yeah, I was on the consistency point. Like, if you put another animal in, do you get very similar distortions or you get completely different? Distortions? Different distortions. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, the yeah the, they'll choose different. Um, they're both distorted, but they're not the same distortions. That's weird. I was going to say, there. Okay, let, let's remind you. There has to be some information to tell the rat its orientation in this room, and to tell the rat um, why the room should be distorted the way it is. Now, maybe the orientation is sufficient for that, but. Um, but there has to be some information to tell them that. So as the problem is posed, there isn't the information provided. There must be something else, whether it's there's generally the orientation is determined by environmental features, which are not shown here. Um, so we don't know, we don't know what those are. And, or as Subutai suggested, it could be more of a reward function for you know food parcels or something like that. Um, but it, it, otherwise there's no explanation for why this distortion, there's no information to lead to this distortion. That's consistent. There has to be some information. If nothing else, there has to be some information to lead to the orientation, which is there's got to be something which breaks the symmetry here. And um, that we don't know what that is. So I think we just don't have enough information here. There's more information that these grid cells are being based on than we know. And we're not, we're not presented with that data. Yeah. So yeah, so my, uh, my final slide is, is nothing new, but basically, this left side is an elegant explanation for distortions. At least, I mean, it sounds good and it may explain some distortions. Um, if it's correct, then a rat, rat's map for this environment probably looks like this. But, <laughs> yeah, okay. but I, basically this is a big if, and that's, yeah. that's where, or, or, or rather, if this is the explanation for these distortions, it means this. Yeah. And so, I mean, this was basically like, you know, a lab meeting. We, showing my weekly results that I that I came with that, that well, I, have I think it's very somewhat successful but yeah and I think it's, what, I think what was successful is bringing up a lot of issues that in clarity on the problem um, because the, it, 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 there are more constraints now that have to be solved um, than before but it, we have a clearer image well I've learned a bunch of things from this today um, I didn't know there was distortions in square environments okay I thought the distortions came about when you put barriers in or you, you, you morphed it to the room or things like that. You know? um, yeah, so it's going to continue to haunt me, is my, is my, yeah, yeah. Is my takeaway. Okay. Well, that's, that's an interesting speaker. Um, anything else on this? Nope, this is it for me. Nice slides. I wish I had the energy to make slides like you. Um, I <laughs> yeah, very, very clear, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I talk about this brief topic? And I have no slides, so I'm gonna have to paint a picture in your head. Okay. So I've been worried, thinking about transformations. And if you recall, um, like a week ago, I talked about, like Monday, I think, I, or was it two weeks ago, I talked about the idea that the thalamus might be doing uh, transformations um, using orientation for both observed feature and the movement vector. And that, that could, could fit within the thalamic um, relay cell model that uh, that Subutai has been working on. Uh, and then, but I, I, but there were some problems with that model. Um, I, the problems with the, the physiology doesn't necessarily match up. Um, so we we're, uh, we're talking about uh, what's his name about it. Um, I can't remember anybody's name. Uh, Carmen. Carmen, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go out the pasture. Um, and there's another problem with it too. And the other problem is there's a lot of reference frame transformations that have to occur, Off, many of them. Now, when we think about this, we're thinking mostly about the hippocampal complex system. And, and there's tons of things going on there. You know, where there's these object vector cells, there's, there's ego object vector cells, there's motion cells, there's, there's velocity cells, there's border cells, there's boundary cells. There's all these things in both ego and allocentric spaces. And, and so there's all these transformations. Now, when we get to the cortex, we don't know if all those things have to occur. 
and um, um, and 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 they and they have to work on different principles, right? So um, uh, so we we don't have to assume everything is going on over in the hippocampal complex happening in the cortex, but the cortex must solve these problems and it has to solve some of them on at least in some cases on a column by column basis. When we think about somatosensory cortex. Each finger, each patch of skin can have a different orientation. That's not so true with the vision. So, you know, there might be a different solution for vision, but, uh, but on a column by column basis, it's almost so sort of small patch, you have to be able to solve these reference transformations with touch and nothing else. And so it occurred to me, and then we, and then we read papers, people saying, oh, well, I, okay, so I have, I, have, I have to do a reference range transformation from my retina to my head, right? So from head centric, retina centric, or from my eyes to my hand. Or my head, it might be from my eye to my head, to my body, to my arm, to my forearm, to my finger, to my tip of my finger. All these reference range transformations going on. And so the biggest problem I see with the phalamic explanation, it, it's limited. It, there's only, it can only do a few transformations. There's a whole ton of transformations that have to occur. And it doesn't seem like the thalamus is in a position to do them all. It's just, it can, do, it can only do the ones that go through the thalamus. There seems to be a lot of other transformations that have to occur that probably wouldn't go through the thalamus. So, I then said to myself, well, what other mechanisms could achieve this? And we have, that we talked about this basic idea. We have, I figure we have the bigger, you know, this at two at two dimension, and there was a n, n by n, or it was an, we had n squared, these conjunctive cells in these things. And so, and then we talked about whether it didn't have to be n squared, if you recall, it could be less than n squared, and we could reuse some of those components and so on. So it occurred to me, this is very, and I don't know if we've talked about this before, maybe we have, maybe we haven't, but this is very similar to the mechanism we use for our temporal memory. The temporal memory, imagine that I have a, a sensory input coming in and I represent it by a series of mini columns in, in a one layer cell, but just on one layer cells, like layer four. And, and now I have, let's say layer six is representing orientation. And so I have this orientation vector, which I project onto the, the cells, and then each of the cells in the, in the mini column representing the different, um, in some sense, orientation becomes the context for that representation. So the mini columns represent the feature in then say an uh, uh, egocentric space. And now I have an orientation and I'm gonna pick a single cell to be active in each of the columns that are active in the representation. And so those are conjunctive cells. Those are the cells that are this feature at this orientation. And I could read that out at that point the active cells would be would uniquely represent that feature at the, at a different orientation. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a different orientation. Does that make sense so far? Uh, have we talked about this before. <laughs> I don't remember. If we yeah. So it. this is this is very almost identical. What you're saying is very similar to what uh, Lewis and I did for the Inumenta Hackathon many years ago. We called it NIC. Oh yeah. Uh, we basically we basically used the temporal memory to learn these mappings. Uh, in like that case, I, we used go, went from join angles and you know do x y locations and back again. I, I totally forgot about that to be honest, so I apologize. Um, but what it does. But the idea was it can basically learn these mappings and ideally in a very yeah. efficient way. So if we yeah. think about a section of cortex and it's got all these mini columns and it's going to be anywhere from a few hundred to about a thousand, depending on the size of the column. And um, and now, but that's not the mini column is not uniform. There's a bunch of subtle layers in there. A whole bunch of different types of cellular layers. And if we just take a, a very rough approximation and say, well, each cellular layer, let's say, behave like our temporal memory. Each cellular layer has a set of cells, maybe eight or 10, 12, something like that, that um, are all representing the same thing in different contexts. So this basic property could exist everywhere in the cortex. And, um, and then, if I want, then anytime, if I want to do a transformation, I take a representation in the cellular layer, which is the mini column representation. I apply the transformation function, which would be orientation, or it could be something else. Um, it's just context. So there's this generic way of saying, I have something in one reference frame or one thing, and I'm going to turn it into a different thing. Um, and I'm going to do that principle, where I just say single cells become active based on that other variable though, orientation variable in this case. Now to, to actually, that, those are my conjunctive cells. And now to, I, I'm gonna pass that information to another layer of cells or someplace else in the cortex. And um, to create out my, my allocentric representation, I have to do a pooling operation because um, 
the, the current set of conjunctive cells are only correct for one particular feat at orientation. A different orientation, the, 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 the egocentric um, representation would be different and have a different set of cells active. So if I were taking an object and, and rotating it, you know, the egocentric representations are changing, but the allocentric representations wouldn't be changing. So I have to pool those. And so that's like, you know, our basic pool and pooling operation. Um, where we would have to say, okay, this is a stable representation and we're trying to map. That's like what we did in the temple memo. Um, and so the question is, could this become, you know, it, it, could this be a principle that applied throughout the cortex? And I wouldn't say every cell is doing this in the cortex, but a lot of layers could be doing this. Um, and then I could use this to doing it transformations of any sort um, and um, whatever I need to do. I also wondered if it could be even, I even started thinking about it in terms of would this work for our displacement cell mechanism? Like, I, I haven't figured that out yet, but I'm, I'm thinking about it, um, which is like, okay, I'm now gonna represent something, uh, whether it's like, whether we thought about it originally as grid cells, but let's say now Marcus's idea, we're, doing, we're gonna do displacements of object vector cells. Right? So I have an object vector cell representation. I'm gonna represent it by some, some mini columns. Um, somehow I'm still doing another transformation. I'm trying to convert it into another representation which is stable while one representation is changing and there's gonna be some, something I have been used to do that with. I haven't figured how to do that yet, but, but there might, this might be a very, very generic idea that you just say, if I take all my representations and put them in these little mini columns and I, and I give you eight or 10 cells, it's not enough. That doesn't reach out to, that's not necessarily enough to get your N squared. Um, you know, but that would be sufficient for sparse calculations. Um, so anyway, that's the idea I'm working on. Uh, that's have you have you noticed that it's it's also I'm guessing you have but have you noticed it's all very similar to the gain fields thing as well that uh, if you want to solve gain fields if you want to if you want to, the same pooling operation you're talking about could be solved by take uh, could um, sorry could solve the problem of figuring out the head centric location of an input given a bunch of different possible yeah I, I did well wait the gain field I never liked gain fields for some reason I just have this thing about some but but I realized. Then we just a couple of weeks ago, we said they're kind of just like conjunctive fields, right? They're, and they're just like our, and I, and I realize these are all the same. I don't think there's a distinction. So, um, so I'm not looking at the gain field literature. Other, I'm just sort of putting it aside saying this has got to be this, it's probably the same thing. Yeah. Um, and, but, but, but I think it could be more generic than just orientation. There could be any, there could be, uh, that's why I'm trying to do like displacements also this way too. Um, um, Anyway, it, it's on, there might be an uber theory here of, of processing, which of course, as a theorist, you'd like to find those, right? It's ideally, it doesn't even exist, but you'd like to find them, which could explain a whole bunch of stuff. And our temporal memory, in some sense, is one example of this. The temporal memory, uh, as, and we've pointed out, pointed out many times, it's, it's, it's another version of this. Um, and uh, and it, it's, it's just solving a different type of problem. Um, Anyway, so that's the idea we're working on. The thing which is which is hanging me up a little bit, and and Marcus, you might you might be able to help me think about this, is if I think about how many things I can represent. Like, let's say I want to I, I want to go. I walk into a room and I'm trying to or I'm seeing a new object. And I'm trying to build up. Um, um, I'm, I'm looking around and my visual cortex is trying to build up a model of this new object. Okay. And the new object has all these different parts. Let's say it's a bicycle, right? Um, and it's got all these parts and the parts are complicated. These aren't simple parts. Um, you know, the sprockets and chains and pedals and crankshafts and tubes and, you know, <laughs> seats and springs and you know, wires and all stuff. And so if I'm looking at a bicycle, I can see all these components. That means that the input to a column has to be able to look, recognize a lot of different components, you know, the, the your, 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 basic building blocks, right? And so I have to be able to represent a lot of things in my spatial pooler, a lot. And when, I, and when we think about like um, object vector cells or like V1 response properties, there aren't a lot of things. It's like there's, a, you know, there's just some, uh, just some you know, 10 different orientations or something as an object vector cell. I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm, I just, I'm worried about capacity. I, I, I'm, I think I can't even express it properly right now, but it, it feels like, um, uh, I'm not sure how this would work uh, if I have to apply these transforms to, I don't know, I, I can't even better express it than that. 
I'm just I'm, I'm worried about capacity. Yeah, I think anyway. the big weakness with that the that sort of learning. I, I mean, there's tons of these reference range transformations you have to do, and every object has its own kind of scale, and and you have to learn all of these relationships, and it, it you have to learn everything sort of independently, and it's you need you would it would be very time consuming and you need a lot of examples but i think that if you combine that basic idea with the stretchy maps idea it may become really feasible and efficient because it, you know well, maybe that you just yeah. learn you know some number small number of it doesn't have to be small well, but it it's be some can't number be of small. maps it, it's still, no, it can't be small but it's it's, it it's small it's, <laughs> that's no, the but problem it's, the point i think is that it's pre-learned and it's, yeah, it's within your capacity. That. It's within not, your capacity limits. And I then when you're given a new thing, you just you know somehow stretch yeah, yeah. what you know to fit this thing. I was I was I viewed this as sort of uh, adjunct to what Mark just been working on. It's not it's not contrary. To it. It's just like I'm solving a different part of the problem. But it may require it uh, to get the what I'm saying is it may require it to really have it work in practice. I know, the but capacity. even then I was I I I have to express the problem better. But um, but I, I I'm. I'm, I'm still confused a bit about the capacity issue. So I agree with you that I'm assuming that there's a, a basic building block, but there's a lot of basic building blocks. And um, there's a lot of them. <laughs> we, and almost anything I, I can recognize is a basic building block. Anyway, it's, it started me to think about hierarchy a bit uh, because the output of a column would, would be a, you know, would be a complex a representation of a complex object. And uh, so now that becomes the input to the next columns. So I have a whole bunch of complex objects that I'm now using as building blocks for the next column. Anyway, I, I still think there's some, there's some merit to this idea and I'm gonna go with it for a bit. Um, I'm gonna read some papers today to try to um, get some more information about um, the connectivity in the cortex. But um, anyway, I, I, that's, that's, and then when I think about this, I say, well, what's the Thalmus doing then? The thing that this doesn't solve, which the Thalmus could solve, um, is we still have our scale issue. I mean, there's only several things we have to solve. We have to solve orientation. We have to solve like location, displacements, and orientation, and then scaling. You know, because scaling is another issue we dealt with. And um, like, like you know, how big is this particular object, or how far away is it? And so, how much do I have to move my eyes to to attend to different parts of it? So it might be that the thalamus is dealing with scale. This is a real hand raising argument. In that all the reference frame transformations are occurring in the cortex, in the tissue itself, um, which would then imply that layer four is basically taking, representing a imp sensory input or an input and, and a, a, the ego or the ego, or the, the, the ego, let's say call it ego now for the moment, the egocentric reference frame. And it's creating a representation which would then be in the allocentric reference frame, but it has to project to layer three Layer three is the first place that pools, and now we then layer three would have the allocentric reference frame. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and but you know, so I'm 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 just thinking through this one. So I, that's it. I have nothing else to report. But it sounds like a you, you already thought of something similar to this before the Nick one, and um, and we've talked. I know we've talked in the past about the, the temporal pooling algorithm sort of being more of a generic type of thing. We talked about it in our columns paper that you could just put in a, um, a location and now you'd have a, um, an object. Um, so anyway, about thinking of it now as a reference train transformation process. So. It's, it's funny that you're looking for like another common circuit for solving a similar problem, solving a set of problems like um, displacements, reference frame transformations, maybe gain fields. Yeah. Um, and it's just funny that this common circuit looks like a flux capacitor. Uh, anyway, <laughs> well, that... it is, but you know, it's interesting. <laughs> if you think about it, though, I, what's different is I don't. I think it, the flux capacitor suggests that there and and, and the gain field, or the way there it was in that Burkansi and Burgess paper, Burgess paper, they they complied there was these conjunctive cells in the middle, and you went through them both ways. But I don't think that's the case here. I think it's, it's one directional. It's more like a triangle or, or something like that, you know, or, or separate arrows. Like I can go from a, um, a layer four representation in a mini column space of an egocentric feature. You can then the individual cells in layer four become the conjunctive features. And then I pull someplace else, but I can't go back through those same cells. 
if I want to go back, I'd have to go to the layer three cells would have to have their own um, conjunctive cells, which then project back <laughs> to something else. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you can't reuse those cells. You can't go two ways through them, which is one thing I always bother me about the, the diagrams like this cancer and surgery paper. It, 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 cells don't do bidirectional stuff. So, so it's a little, it's like the flux capacitor with some, I don't know, we have to come up with a better metaphor for it. <laughs> um, also, it doesn't, as we, you and I talked personally, Marcus, last week, um, it doesn't, you can't use it to resolve orientation. Like orientation is, is a, there's three variables you're trying to solve. It's the egocentric and the allocentric and the orientation. But you can't, I don't believe you can use it to resolve the orientation. That is, the orientation has to be given and you can go between the other two. But I don't think you can say, oh, I know my allocentric and my egocentric, I can now resolve the orientation. So yeah, what you're saying is definitely correct when you're rotating a displacement vector. Uh, so yes, yeah. there are cases where you can set an orientation, but in this case, you totally agree. So I've been thinking about this every night in my sleep the last few days, and um, I haven't. I'm still stuck on various pieces, but I'm excited about it. I'm working on it. I, had, I think there's at least there's a possibility that a very big group of principles come out of it that could explain a hell of a lot of stuff. So I just thought I'd share that. Um, if anybody has any thoughts about it for the years to go along, share. One quick one thought on um, the other thing you mentioned in passing that maybe Thalamus is doing scaling. Um, yeah. Just to put something probably back on your radar. We haven't talked about this before, but I'm guessing you've seen it. It's, so Bruno Olshausen, before his sparse coding stuff, uh, one widely cited paper he has from, I think, 93, involves scaling of the visual input, but he doesn't do it in Thalamus. He does it across levels of hierarchy. Um, mm -hmm. or rather, he does it, you know, I, I'm not going to remember very well, but he talks about it happening somewhere between V1, V2, V4. I don't um, oh, is, oh, is this do as like Is this as like routing thing? Yeah, he's paper. Yeah, he he, he yeah. doesn't believe that anymore. I don't. Okay. I write it. Yeah, um, I asked him about it. And he's, yeah, that's right. But uh, but but here's you know but but scaling is very much involved in attention. Like attention, we know that the we know that the thalamus is involved in attention. There's a whole bunch of papers on that, but they're all kind of wonky. But um, but the idea that to attend to something. It's, it could, in a sense, in some sense, you, you can say, okay, I'm moving my gaze towards it, or you know, I, I move my eyes. That's you know, attention, but that's the that's the active attention. Um, but then the the covert attention, it could be a, something like, okay, I've now I'm now going to scale that thing um, to bring it into the right, um, you know, because I, that part of that attention posture could be scaling, um, and so. You're now going to zoom it in or zoom or whatever, so that I can manipulate it as uh, without dealing with this. And you know, I can deal with these differences in distance and vision, or um, you know, I'm holding a coffee cup that was smaller than the original one. So I think that it kind of loosely fits in with the whole attention idea for the thalamus. Scaling would be part of attention. It would be an important part. You, know. um, you basically have to attend to something to know how to scale. Like, okay, I'm going to manipulate this from a distance, or I'm going to move my eyes different amounts, or I'm going to, you know, I have to move my fingers different amounts. Um, the whole object model has to scale. I need to, attending to it means I am now going to figure out the scaling factor to, to manipulate it. So, um, so that kind of fits. It also fits in the idea that, um, that I've always had with matrix cells doing scaling of sequences and time. It's also consistent with that. It's another type of scaling, time scaling. Okay, that's um, that's 